Hello everybody, this is Tim here again, here with my review for Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Just to jerk out my four pack here. So you can see Freddy has a new look in this film. Huh. Film stars Robert England, Heather Lincoln Camp, Miko Hughes, David Newsom, and John Saxon. So written and directed by Wes Craven. Okay, now this film, um, Wes Craven claims, Wes Craven claims that he watched all the other films, all the other sequels, I guess, and couldn't understand the plot line at all, which I don't really know why, I, so I think he kind of wanted, just, he just wanted to use that as an excuse so he could do his own film with this, I think is what it was, which is understandable, I'll admit, uh, regardless of how good or bad the sequels were, any of them, I don't think any of them were as good as the first one, so I can respect him wanting to try, you know, something, you know, completely different, and he did, and this movie's pretty much a prelude to what he would be doing with Scream, uh, which I think Scream is a better film than this, <clears throat> but, um, I still think this is a really good movie, I just go ahead and give my rating, I give this film three stars out of possible four, or a solid three, um, it's the third best film in the franchise. It's not as good as one, and it's not as good as number three, Dream Warriors. The only thing that really hurts this film and keeps it from being not as good as Dream Warriors uh, is because the ending of this film is just too theatrical. It's just too like reminiscent. It just with the ending of this film and the things that Freddy does would fit better in one of the more over the top Freddy movies like number four uh, or number five. It just doesn't fit like the style the movie's going for. Like the build up in the all, and most of this film is like build up, build up, build up. Uh, it relies more on suspense, really. And most of that is like the build up and everything that happens in it is actually better than the film itself, I would say. Or not the film itself, but the climax, I mean, at the end. Because Freddy, I think, just gets too, just gets too over the top, I think, in a way. But I'll just get, to, I'll get to that when we get there. We start the film off, we got Heather Lincoln Camp playing herself. Which is very interesting. I think I actually think this is uh, Heather Lankenkamp's best performance, but she's playing herself, so she probably doesn't have to stretch her acting ability too far. But I do think this is her best performance of the three films she's in, Dream Warriors being her weakest performance. Uh, I think this is her best performance of the three films she's in. So to film off, she's having like a, a nightmare where she's like working on the set of an, uh, another Nightmare on Elm Street film. <clears throat> it probably is a nightmare she has in real life that she's still doing these movies, but... Um, so I think that's funny, uh, but uh, she's working on the film with her husband, who's a special effects artist, and her son, played by Miko Hughes from Pet Cemetery. Uh, Miko Hughes, I like, I don't mind too much. In this film, though, he does get a little bit annoying sometimes, but uh, that's more just like what he's, you know, having to do in the film, and not really him, the actor himself. But we'll get to that. But um, she's having a nightmare about working on the set of a new Freddy film. Um, Wes Craven's there playing himself, which is interesting. His acting is is okay. Uh, he's passable. He only has a small role in the film. Um, but he's there. They're on the set. They're filming this new movie. Fred, uh, it's not like the way the film starts out because it's got Freddy like a, or an act, a stunt man pretending to be Freddy or pretending or playing the character. I mean, he's like, it kind of reminds me. It's reminiscent of like the way the first movie started out with Freddy, Freddy making his glove. In this film, Freddy has a new glove uh, and a new look. His new look is like more muscular, kind of like the face looks more muscular to me, and he looks more demonic in the film, which I don't mind too much. I don't really mind his new look. I don't really have a problem with it. This movie's only like, it's only a one-off, really, this movie is, because it's not really, it's part of the franchise, but it's not a sequel. It's its own universe. So, like, if they were to do another Nightmare on Elm Street film that was a sequel, it, uh, it would probably be like a Nightmare, it would probably be called a Nightmare on Elm Street 7 instead of, you know, New Nightmare Part 2 is what I'm saying. This film is pretty much its own universe, <clears throat> which is fine. But yeah, to jump straight to the film, back to the film here. They're uh, filming the like the new Elm Street film in her nightmare, um, and you get a scene where this guy like chops off his hand, and he's like putting the new Freddy glove on there, and it's like this robot glove, which is uh, which is kind of interesting. It's like uh, some kind of mechanical glove, and then of course after that you find out it's like a movie set, which is you know a. a an interesting idea for like uh, the Freddy character to be like, or a demon in the guise of Freddy to be like haunting, you know, the fucking film crew who works on these films. I thought that was an interesting idea. But um, so you get uh, Heather Lankenkamp there. She's there with uh, Miko Hughes playing her son Dylan. 
And uh, David Newsom, I think, is the actor who plays her husband, Chase, in the film. I think is his name. Chase Porter, I believe. Um, but uh, you got him there. He's all right. Um, and they'll, uh, they're, like, fucking checking on the glove. These, <laughs> like, uh, they're checking the mechanics out on the glove or whatever and seeing uh, the other the, the, uh, robot glove, mechanical glove or whatever. They're checking it out to see how it works and everything. And all at once, uh, Chase, it, like, flies off and cuts Chase's fingers. And uh, I love this scene kind of cracks me up. One of the special effects guys is like, must have picked up a signal from an 80s walkie-talkie. 80s walkie and this, uh, this guy goes, funny, it's warm, just like a real hand. And it fucking like leaps up and jabs the dude straight in the throat. And uh, I thought that was a cool scene. And then it, he's fucking dead. And then it falls down and starts running across the table. Um, cuts this other dude's legs and he falls down. And it jumps on top of him and like fucking jabs right in his chest. And blood like squirts out like everywhere. Like, uh, so I thought that, I thought that was cool to enter, just an entertaining opening nightmare. I don't think this opening nightmare is as good as one or two, but I still, I th but I still think it's really creative and I do enjoy it. Kind of like the, you think they're working on a movie, but it's actually a nightmare sequence. I thought that was kind of funny. Although I don't really know who wouldn't have thought it was a nightmare sequence at this point, regardless of how they tried to play it, because this being the seventh movie in the franchise and they've all started with nightmares. But anyway. So you get that, and then it jumps, the uh, the fucking glove, like, jumps towards Chase, and then all at once, bam, you know, an earthquake happens, and Heather Lankenkamp wakes up in her house, and Chase wakes up, and he's got, the earthquake, like, wakes them all up, and he's got the fucking cuts, like, around his three fingers, I believe it's these three, I'm not for sure, but, um, right, uh, or at least three right here, I think, but, uh, of course, he's got the cuts right on his fingers, because, you know, whatever happens in dreams happens in reality. But uh, the funny thing is, is that Heather Lankenkamp's character in the film is getting uh, phone calls, like harassing phone calls by like, some stalker, or she thinks it's a stalker, but of course it's actually Freddy Krueger. And in the original script, I believe it was actually the babysitter's character who was the stalker, and Freddy was like using her to torment the family, which would have been interesting. But I'm kind of glad they shifted the shifted the focus to be completely on Freddy. I think I kind of like that better, or this version of Freddy. But uh, she gets uh, phone calls, and uh, I actually think the this one, the first one in the movie, kind of cracks me up. She answers the phone, and it's like one, two, and then she puts slams it back down. And it rings again. She answers it, and it goes, "Freddy's coming for you." <laughs> oh, that was funny. That was mildly funny. I got a laugh out of that. Dylan, the character Dylan in the film, her son seems to know, seems to know more about what's going on, you know, like in the movie, or uh, than than she does. You know, he's like more savvy to what's going on and what Freddy's trying to do. He kind of knows it a little bit too much. There's a scene. I mean, he kind of knows a little bit too much. There's a scene where he, like, fucking, like, is telling uh, Heather about, like, his uh, nightmare he had. And she asks him, like, what's the mean old man with the... He, he, tells her it's, he, had, he tells her he had a dream about the mean old man with the claws. And she's like, what's that man trying to do? And, he, and he's like, uh, he's trying to get up. Trying to get up into our world. And I'm like, how the fuck do you know that? Did Freddy, like, pull you aside and go, yeah, hey, buddy, you know, I'm going to try to break into the real world. You know, I'm kind of bored with movies. I'm like, what? How the fuck would you know that? But anyway, it's exposition, I know, but still, how the fuck would you know that? <clears throat> but, uh, so, uh, she goes to, like, do this interview about the Nightmare on Elm Street films, and I think this is, this scene actually kind of makes me laugh a little, because, uh, fucking Robert Englund guest stars on the talk show, and he comes out in full Freddy makeup, which kind of makes you think, you know, that this film is going to be something completely different than the other films, which it is. Um, Wes Craven actually had this, wanted to do this idea for the third film for Dream Warriors, but the studio said no. <laughs> so they finally let him reuse the idea here, or, or use the idea here, I mean, uh, after they had, well, I guess finished the films with number six. But um, anyway, Robert England pops out in full Freddy makeup, and he goes up to Heather Lincoln Camp, and he's like, Love you, babe. We'll do lunch. <laughs> This is the scene kind of to give him a little bit more room, like Freddy a little bit more room to be more of the jokester and more over the top like he is in some of the later films. Uh, because most of the time in this film, Freddy's going to be played like super serious uh, or or at least more darker and darker humor that fits more with the first movie than what he is here. Right here he seems more, more like the Freddy of like uh, 4 and 5 and uh, maybe a little bit of 3. Right here in this scene, he's like waving his arms around saying, 
you're all my children now, or something similar to that. And the audience is like all there cheering on Freddy, and you get a close up of like Heather Langenkamp's face, kind of like where she's like amazed, you know, of like how much Freddy's in embra- like been embraced by people. I think is what we're supposed to get here. That she's kind of like amazed by how much he, the character's like been embraced by audiences, considering you know he's an evil scumbag. But he, what can we say? He's a lovable evil scumbag. We can't get enough of him. But anyway. That kind of seems like what they're trying to say right there. She got that, and then she comes back home, and her, uh, well, she actually goes to a meeting with Bob Shay. Bob Shay's, like, asking her if she wants to come back for another Freddy movie, and, uh, she says no, um, but you get the idea that Bob Shay is getting the harassing phone calls, too, or, like, the people at work at New Line Cinema are because they're working on the new Freddy movie as well, which kind of makes me laugh because I can picture, like, you know, Freddy calling up Bob Shay, just the idea of, like, Freddy calling up Bob Shay. I don't, I don't, you don't really need that, I mean, that he's harassing those people, too, because, I mean, what's the point? I'm, I kind because I get the idea that Freddy wants the movie to be made, so why would he be harassing, you know, other people that are working on the film other than Heather? Heather makes sense, but why other people? I mean, wouldn't they, you know, he wouldn't he want the movie to be made? But whatever. So he's, uh... So he's, uh, he's harassed, he's like, uh, I, I mean, I just get a laugh out of picture, you know, Freddy calling Bob Shay and going... Like Bob Shay picking up the phone and Freddie going, "Hey Bob Shay, you make another smooth, you make you make another nightmare film in the style of Freddie's Dead, and you're fucking dead." <laughs> I just picture that. That just makes me laugh for some reason out in Hawaii. Forgive me, I just think it's funny. But uh, she comes home and Dylan's like screaming his head off, and you get a, a, a creepy scene here where Dylan's like. Uh, Heather picks him up, and he's like, never sleep again. <laughs> I thought that was creepy, and I like the way Miko Hughes played it. I like that. And uh, all through the movie, you get, like, weird scenes where he, like, Heather wakes up in the middle of the night, and Dylan's, like, fucking sleepwalking. And uh, she, <laughs> he's, like, fucking watching the original Nightmare on Elm Street on TV. And Heather will walk up to him and, like, shake him and be like, Dylan, what are you doing? All at once he'll start going, ah, screaming his head off. And that's where he gets a little annoying for me. He screams, like, nonstop. That just gets a little annoying for me. Not because I don't like Miko Hughes, not because I don't think he does good in the film, because he does. It's just that anybody screaming like that for a few minutes, it just fucking annoys me. I just can't stand that shit. So I didn't like that. But uh, other than that, he's fine. He's got like this little dinosaur he puts at the bottom of his bed um, to like protect him from Freddy, I guess. Kind of like a guardian thing, which I kind of thought they missed an opportunity with that. It would have kind of been more theatrical, but, you know, that kind of made me interested. I would have liked to have seen, you know, because Rex, the dinosaur, would have been real in Dylan's dreams. So I would have liked to have seen, you know, the dinosaur, like, Freddy versus a motherfucking raptor or something. You know, that would have been an interesting scene. That uh, that would have been kind of neat. I wouldn't have minded that because uh, there's a scene where, uh, you know, Dylan wakes up and the dinosaur's got, like, some claw marks on it. So I would have liked to have seen, like, Freddy, like, slashing at a raptor or something. I don't know. It probably wouldn't have fit in the film, but fuck it. It would have been fun. I would have liked to have seen it. Sue me. But anyway. And so Dylan just keeps getting worse and worse. And she's, uh, Heather's like getting, getting sent fucking letters in the mail. Or it looks kind of like Bible pages, ripped out Bible pages with like uh, words burned into them. Of course, later on you find out it says answer the phone. And you got like, you get like a really creepy scene where Heather wakes up and Dylan's like walking around like saying, never sleep again. <laughs> and the fucking like pages are sitting there and it says answer the phone. And then the fucking phone rings, and she grabs it, and it's like Freddy on the other end, and he goes, I touched him. <laughs> I'm like, I touched him? Uh. <laughs> but anyway, then the fucking phone starts, like, spitting up, and then, like, he starts, like, he vomits or something like that out of his mouth. Well, it's, like, kind of, like, spit up, though, more. More like he's spitting up or something. Uh, and then he starts, like, jerking and convulsing on the ground, on the floor, I mean, and Heather runs up right to him, you know, fucking freaked out, don't know what to do. I like that scene. I thought that was mildly interesting. Uh, or not mildly, I mean, that's a stupid thing to say, mildly interesting, I mean, I like that scene, I thought it was a good scene, well filmed, and it shows, you know, the further advent- further adventures of Dylan's psychotic break, <laughs> so I thought that was entertaining, um, uh, Heather's, uh, husband gets killed in the film, uh, she calls, like, she calls her husband and tells him that Dylan's had a psychotic episode, basically, because Freddy's been tormenting him, tormenting him, and he keeps fucking, you know, screaming and shit, so she tells Chase about it, and, uh, he decides to come and, uh, to come and, you know, go visit his son and check on him, see if he's okay, uh, he leaves the film he's working on, which he told her it was a commercial, but he's actually working on, like, fucking the new Freddy movie, He's like designing the new, helping design the new Freddy glove, I think, or just working on the film in general, doing special effects. But uh, he falls asleep at the wheel, 
you use a hug. You get kind of some weak CGI in the film, like these little ripples at the bottom of his seat, where it's like Freddy's gloves or claws coming up out of it. It's kind of weak. Uh, the CGI is is like little waves, little ripples, kind of weak. But uh, the CGI is the look of it. Um, but then all at once, Freddy's like whole fucking glove comes busting up out of the middle of his, between his legs and just jabs him directly in the chest and like rips him down his chest like that, and he just he crashes the truck. You know he's dead, which. That was an entertaining scene. I like that dream kill. Uh, the kills in this film are more less theatrical, like they were, less theatrical like they were in the later films, like with people turned into bugs and stuff. Even though I like that stuff, uh, these film, these kills are like more laid back and more just mean and you know, just uh, mean and like bloody and kind of more reminiscent of the first film. Um, and yeah, and less over the top. But they're still really cool, and the over-the-top kills like of the later films wouldn't have fit this movie at all. So I'm glad they went with the kills they did. Um, so you get that, and then you get a creepy scene where Heather's at the funeral, and uh, she's got Dylan there, and the earthquake happens, and she like falls and hits her head, and she's fucking like uh, Dylan's missing. She's in a nightmare, and she looks down. She's having a nightmare. She looks down there and sees the fuck like, Freddy's got Dylan, and Freddy's like, ha 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 ha, fucking like dragging him down into the. Uh, like this uh, underground tunnel, like under, below the coffin. She jumps down there and comes after him, and she manages to get Dylan. Uh, and then all at once, fucking Chase like comes to life. His corpse does, and like grabs a hold of her and starts going, "Stay with me, Heather. Stay with me." <laughs> His fucking eyes were bleeding like right through here. I thought that I thought that was cool. That was really fucking creepy. Uh, that worked really well for this film. Uh, which is why the ending, the final of the film, kind of disappoints me a, a little. Because that's why I made me drop the film from four stars to three. Because the final is just kind of a little bit silly and too over the top for a film like this. Or for one of the more serious Freddy films like this. Um, but anyway, so uh, you get that funeral scene, which I like. Uh, another problem with the film is that I would have liked you know, to see more of Freddy like haunting or... Uh, or, I mean, not haunting, but, you know, given the other cast members of the film, Nightmares and stuff, that would have been cool. I would have liked this film better if it was more of an ensemble movie with Heather's character as, like, you know, the main victim of Freddy's in the film. I would have liked that better than what we got. That would have been more enjoyable to me, I think. But, uh, also, Freddy killed the character Nancy in Dream Warriors. So, why would he be going after, why would he need to kill Nancy here? Uh, or her Heather, who but he sees Heather as Nancy. But why would he need to kill her, considering the character was killed off in three? Realistically, he should he should probably be going after Alice or Lisa Zane. But um, but it works better with Heather. I don't think it would have worked, it, despite the fact I like the character Alice better than I do uh, the character Nancy. Um, it works much better with him going after Nancy. It it just works better in the context of the film. It wouldn't have worked that it wouldn't have worked at all. I don't think with either of those other two. But, um, so that's kind of a little hole for me. Um, she decides to take Dylan to the, to the doctor. Uh, this doctor here is, um, the doctor's character is supposed to be like a representation of film critics or people in general, I think, who just think horror movies are to blame for everything or, or some type of violent art is to blame for everything. And, uh, she automatically just believes, you know, did you show him any of your films, Heather? Maybe that's why, you know, he's acting this way. Uh, and I'm like, oh, fuck, come on. I mean, I like that idea that the character represents that, but her being a doctor and I'm actually jumping to that conclusion, I kind of don't buy it. But it, it works. I mean, it's not too big a deal. Just a little nitpick there for me. But, uh, so you got that. She, uh, they're keeping Dylan there, uh, for observation. They think it's like childhood fucking schizophrenia or something happening. You get a scene in the film, it's kind of like a dream within a dream scene earlier in the film before she takes him to the doctor. And uh, she's like having a nightmare, and Freddy's glove like comes up out of the bed, and it gets like right near her face, and gets ready to claw her. And all at once, these knives fall out of a drawer, and the glove, the hand, his hand goes back inside the bed. And uh, she gets up, and she fucking goes down there, and there down there is like Miko Hughes with fucking uh, <clears throat> he's got like knives taped to his fingers, like the Freddy glove, trying to make it like that, make it make his own homemade Freddy glove, which is kind of funny because I was when I was a little kid, I tried you know similar stuff being a little kid. But, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, he, like, uh, uh, starts slinging it at her and trying to, well, he starts, like, trying to stab her with the knives, I mean, and she's, like, holding him off, and then she wakes up again, uh, and it was, like, a dream within a dream, and I'm, like, 
not that's a neat idea, but still, why would Freddy give her a dream within a dream when he had the claws right at her head the first time? Why wouldn't he just, you know, claw her in the face? Uh, but whatever, it's still all right. Um, then you got the babysitter in the film, the character Julie. She's she's fine. Um, she, but you, at the beginning of the film, you kind of get like this ominous look on her face that makes you think maybe she shouldn't be trusted. And it's put there because in the original script, she was uh, she was going to be the one that was harassing you know Heather as the stalker or whatever. She was going to be the stalker character. But they wanted to put the focus, you know, completely on Freddy instead of Freddy, you know, working through someone or using someone, uh, which I actually like that better. I prefer the focus being on Freddy doing everything. That's better to me. That's better. But um, also in the film, you get uh, a really heartwarming scene where after Chase is dead, uh, Heather is talking to Dylan about it. And he's like, and he's like, where's daddy now? And she's like, uh, he's with God now. And he's like, do you have to die to see God? And she goes, uh, no, I think you just have to pray and reach out. Um, which I think this is a really, you know, kind of a heartwarming scene. Well, not so much. Well, kind of a sweet scene between the two. Not so much sweet, but, you know, real. it's a realistic scene is what I'm saying. Even though the film is a fantasy, it's got like, you know, it's got a, it's got a realistic feel to it. A mature feel to it that the other later Elm Street films didn't really have. They had more of a... A fun, you know, more, it's kind of a slightly more like they were trying to appeal to them, to teens a little bit more than adults a little bit, or what's hip, you know, at that time for teenagers, instead of like, well, this story just feels more adult to me, especially with, especially with the mother and her son, you know, going through everything. This is much more adult story to me. Um, but uh, yeah, so you got that. That is that was in the uh, that I like that scene, and then you got a scene at the playground. Where he like actually tries to reach God and climbs on top of this playground uh, equipment and tries to actually reach up into the sky and try to reach God, um, and then uh, he falls and fucking John Saxon and Heather Lankenkamp are there, you know, talking about what's been going on and uh, John Saxon, uh, no Heather catches him and uh, she's like, what, what were you doing or whatever? And he's like, uh, God wouldn't take me, and I'm like, damn, <laughs> that's a pretty epic scene. Uh, that was a good scene. Um, then we get back to. Um, like uh, back to the hospital, uh, you find if you don't get a lot of like Freddy FaceTime in this film, like, but you get like really creepy stuff though that makes up for it. Like this film has more of a creepy uh, atmosphere. It's definitely scarier than anything in four, five, and six. Um, I actually think it's scarier than part two as well. At least up until the ending of the film, uh, the climax just kills the horror a little bit for me. Um, but um. So, uh, I forgot what the fuck I was talking about. I lost track of what, of what I was saying there for a minute. But, uh, what the fuck was I talking about? But, oh yeah. Um, well, I forgot what I was talking about. I don't know why I just blanked out. But to get back to where I was, she, uh, oh yeah, fuck. I don't know why I forgot. I blanked out for some reason. I got confused about where I was at in the movie. But, yeah. She has, uh, you don't get a lot of Freddy face time, but like I said, the film makes up for it with the horror element, with the creepiness of it, and the suspense really done well. Um, but she finally has a nightmare where fucking Freddy actually shows up completely. And he starts uh, like slashing, slashing at her and everything, and trying to like fucking uh, cut the shit out of her. She knocks his, she knocks his brains out with a, I don't know if it was a vase or a coffee pot one. I know she hits him with a coffee pot in the first movie, but I'm not, I think she might hit him with a vase here, but. By the way, he was entertaining. Um, she falls down the bed, and he like looks at her, and he instead of, so he doesn't see her as Heather, so he's like Nancy, <laughs> which uh, I like that idea that he sees her as Heather. I mean, sees her as Nancy instead of Heather. And then an earthquake happens, and he like claws her on the arm, and she wakes up from that. So I kind of get the idea that the earthquakes in the film are not actual earthquakes, or at least the ones that uh, Heather feels aren't. And they're like Freddy trying to break through the fictional world into reality. I think is what they are. Which, uh, that, that's kind of interesting as well. That's kind of neat. You get a scene in the film where she, like, goes to visit fucking, uh, actual, actually Wes Craven. To talk about what's going on. And, uh, Wes Craven, you know, tells her, uh, that, um, that, uh, once in a while a story will come out that will be, you know, good enough or decent enough or whatever to capture the essence of this creature and, uh, hold it captive in that story. But then when they, you know, finish the films off and Freddy's dead, that, you know, release the character from the fictional universe that he was trapped in. Now he's free to roam 
and he likes being Freddy now, and he enjoys, you know, our time and space of our real world, and so he wants to actually be Freddy and make the movies into reality, and that's a pretty cool fucking idea. That's a pretty cool ass idea. Sorry, uh, but that yeah, that's a pretty cool ass idea. Uh, yeah, that's a really cool idea. I don't think it was used in the film to its full potential of like the movie people, like the actors becoming their characters, uh, you know, like of the film and stuff. I don't think it's used to its full potential. It would have been awesome to have a Robert England nightmare, but we don't get one. I think in the original script, Robert England did have a Freddy nightmare where he was trapped in a web and Freddy was like a fucking giant spider or something like that. Um, but they said they don't think the scene would have fit the tone of the film. Um, it kind of wouldn't. But you could make it work. You could, and but even if it didn't, you still could. You still should have done a Freddy Robert England face to face nightmare, uh, somehow, some way, shape, or form, because it would have just been so fucking cool. And at the end of the film, when the people start actually becoming their characters, you should have had Robert England transform into Freddy. Instead, Robert England just like leaves in the middle of the movie, and uh, Heather gets like his answering machine, and he like fucking says, uh, "You reached the England residence. We're gonna be gone for a while." So I'm like, that's a little lame. They just wrote him out. I, that was fucking lazy, I thought. But um, other than that, the film still holds up pretty good, except for the final, which once again I will get to. <laughs> but um, so he tells her what's happened. You kind of Wes Craven kind of makes little jabs at the franchise, you know, as a whole, as like what they did to Freddy, because uh, he explains, you know, when the story dies is when the evil is set is when the evil is set free that's been held captive in the story. And he's kind of like says uh, it could happen. It can happen in a lot of ways. You know, maybe the it was banned from society just because it was too outrageous or something like that. I think. And then he says uh, it can happen from people watering it down to make it an easier sell. Kind of like a jab at the sequels to what they did with the character to make Freddy more mainstream to the point where he just anything left of the how he originally was in the first movie is gone. Which that was Freddy's dad that eventually did that. But um. The other films did it just less and less until the point where with Freddy's dad, he didn't even barely resemble the original character, really, to me at all. But, um, so I kind of, I get what he's saying, uh, with that jab at the, at the franchise. I mean, it makes sense. So I don't really so much blame him for it. But, um. But yeah, so then you get a really cool scene where like it focuses in on the script that's on Wes Craven's computer and like everything that he's been saying or they've been talking about is actually part of the script that he's been writing for this film and that he's actually been having nightmares of the events that's been happening in the film, which is pretty fucking cool. Uh, I like that. And then all, at the bottom of the script, uh, it says fade to black and then the scene actually fades to black. That was really cool. Uh, so now that Heather knows what's going on, she comes there. She wants to get, you know, Dylan the fuck out of there out of the hospital uh she goes there julie is there you get an interesting scene here where the doctor's like put uh well bef uh, before that before i get to that scene i want to talk about the scene right here where uh heather falls asleep in her chair and she has a nightmare where dylan like starts puking at her and puking at her and vomiting at her uh it's kind of a little bit too random he's like he's like pukes all over spits out vomit all over we're in her nightmare that she has she falls asleep at the hospital too reminiscent of the exorcist for me I didn't like that too much, too much like The Exorcist, but the next scene I do like when the nerd, when the doctor comes in there and uh, it, she, she like transforms into Freddy and she's like, this little booger's full of something I don't like. Let's cut this evil out of him. I thought that was funny. I like that. That was a good scene. Um, and so she's and she wakes up from that, Heather does, and she wants to know, you know, where the fuck's Dylan. Um, she goes down there, the doctor's actually put Dylan to sleep while they're like talking to uh, Heather. About wanting to put him in foster care because they don't want they don't trust her. I don't guess, or the main doctor doesn't. Um, and then uh, Julie see uh, Julie sees one of them like sneak around and like uh, drug Dylan uh, with a needle to like fucking put him to sleep, and she punches uh, punches the fucking uh, nurse in the face, which I thought was funny. I like that, you know, some good retaliation, you know, knock that asshole out. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I like that. But uh, he starts falling asleep, and this scene right here. Uh, I don't really get too much because it doesn't really explain to you clearly what is the what kind of powers this version of Freddy has and what he doesn't. I mean, I don't get it completely uh, because in the film it kind of seems like the characters have to be asleep for Freddy to attack them. But in this scene right here, it's Dylan who falls asleep and Julie gets attacked. So I'm not really sure what's happening. 
Uh, I th it, might, it might be a plot hole, I don't know, or it might just be where now he's able to come into the real world so much he can just attack anybody he wants to, just come through like, like he's coming through Dylan's dreams, I think, or something like that, it doesn't ex really explain it at all, but, uh, but you get that, he attacks Julie, fucking jabs her in the back with his new glove, which is like, uh, the glove is actually like, the claws are like made into his hand, and he's got uh, one, he's actually got a thumb claw now instead of just four. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, the new glove, I don't mind. I don't mind it. Some people don't like Freddy's look in the film. I don't really have too much of a problem with it. They, they tweak his look in every movie. So this for just being a one-off film, you know, with his look only going to be used this one time. I don't have, um, I don't really have a problem with it. But he's like fucking dragging her all across the ceiling. He kills her in the same way that he killed Tina in the first movie. He comes over and looks at Dylan and says, "Hey, Dylan, ever played Skin the Cat?" <laughs> I thought that was funny. I like that. I love that. I love that scene. That's really cool. Uh, that was a really good scene. Sorry about that little jump cut right there, but uh, I got a phone call right in the middle of the fucking review. <clears throat> but anyway, back to what I was saying. So uh, Julius killed. Dylan takes off out of there. He's trying to make it across the freeway to get back to his house. Heather takes off after him. Uh, she's going across the freeway. You get some pretty decent dream stuff right here. I, I kind of like, I really like this uh, scene right here on the freeway where like Freddy appears in the clouds. I thought that was inventive and fun. I think I may have heard from somewhere that they actually had a scene here where they was going to do like Freddy in a fucking claw mobile, like running down the freeway, driving down the freeway. The hat right there would have been too theatrical for the film. I wouldn't have liked that. That would have been too much. <clears throat> But um, Freddy appears in the clouds and like takes his claw and like fucking lifts up Dylan and is like holding him over top of like trucks, like for, act like he's gonna drop him, like vehicles coming by, like he's gonna drop him in front of him, let him get run over. And uh, but uh, Dylan does manage to get free. Uh, he manages to make it out of there. But Heather gets like in a really cool action scene. This truck like goes directly over top of her and she almost gets hit by it. Um, and then she fucking gets hit by a car though. <laughs> It's an entertaining action scene. I like that. And then all these like little mini Freddies pop up on like the other side of the freeway, and they're all looking at uh, Miko Hughes going, Dylan. <laughs> I thought that was entertaining. That was neat. He manages the Dylan manages to make it back home though, and then uh, Heather Langenkamp makes it back home. And one weird thing in the movie is that you know it's her son. He's in trouble, and it's supposed to be like you know more reality based. And but she calls up John Saxton, you know, to get help to help her find Dylan. And I'm thinking. And would you call up the actor you're friends with, or wouldn't you call up someone you know who's in your family? I know why they have to do it because, of course, they're not going to cast like Heather's brother or uncle or whoever uh, to be in the film. <laughs> but um, but still, it doesn't make much sense. I mean, it really just it doesn't fit why she would really call John Saxton. No matter how good a friend you are with somebody like that, you still would probably call um, somebody you're related to. I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't. That's just me. But still. But uh, yeah, you get that. A uh, little John Saxon nitpick there, but I do love seeing him in the film. But you get that. Um, she managed to make it back there, and now um, right here at this very moment is when the movie world like merges with the real world, and fucking uh, he turns into his character of uh, the, the lieutenant from the first movie, and uh, she's wearing like her, na her Nancy like fucking. Uh, She's wearing her Nancy outfit from the first movie, and so they've become their characters now. Right here, it would, once again, it would have been cool to get a scene with like Robert Englund transforming into Freddy Krueger. That would have been cool, but no, we don't get that, so eh, and downer on that one. In the movie, though, you get like a scene where she's like reading uh, Dylan like this, this fucking like fairy tale, um, which is pretty cool. It's like Hansel and Gretel, and she's talking about how violent it is. And obviously, it's like Wes Craven's way of trying to say, you know, violence has existed in, you know, media uh, or in entertainment uh, way before, you know, horror films were made. And so parent groups, you know, that like have problems with like horror films and stuff like that, are they so stupid they don't realize that the story of Hansel and Gretel is, you know, even more sad, I think, in ways and more violent than the film we're actually watching. Uh, but of course, for some reason people don't notice that. It's just because they've come to accept it so much. It's been around so long that they don't even notice it anymore. And they've just become numb to it, that they just don't notice stuff like that. And it's just because, like, the entertainment world and the media world and everything, you know, uh, just tells them, tells people what is, you know, what is violent and what isn't. So people don't really have the mind to think for themselves. And they can't even realize how much violence is actually in these old style fairy tales and shit like that. At least I don't think they can. Or at least they don't seem like they can, or most people can't for some reason. But um, 
yeah, you got that. I really like that. And in the story, it mentions like leaving a trail of breadcrumbs so like your mother or father or whoever can find you. And Dylan actually uses sleeping pills to leave for uh, Heather Lincoln Camp at the end of the movie. And she finds, uh, she takes the sleeping pills like as they were like breadcrumbs leading the trail to Dylan's bed. Got a cool scene where Robert, where Freddie like comes up out of the bed. Uh, it's a really cool scene. And Heather accepts her role as Nancy by, you know, looking at John Saxon saying, I love you, daddy. And uh, so that means that she's like, you know, accepted her role as the film character, Nancy. Um, so Freddie kind of has to kill Nancy because uh, she was the first one to defeat him in the first film. Um, and uh, she's kind of like the gatekeeper. Like if he can kill her and get by her, he has full access to the real world, which is an interesting idea. So if that's why he's been tormenting her son because, you know, he's going to go at her, try to go at her at her most vulnerable point. Um, so that's why he's been tormenting Dylan. But she goes into Freddy's world after taking way too many sleeping pills that probably should have killed her. That was a little silly. She takes like, what, six? Six or seven sleeping pills? That's too many. <laughs> but, um, so she goes into Freddy's world. It's like this really, you know, kind of cool, like an old, ancient looking world. Looks really cool, though. I like the look of it. There, when she like she like goes through the Dylan's bed and it takes her down like this crazy ass looking fucking tunnel and she like comes flying out of this giant Freddy mouth at the end of it and there's like this bat creature that flies by and I'm like what the fuck was that you see it for like a brief second and I'm like the fuck is that like like dinosaurs or pterodactyls in this creature's world or whatever <laughs> this demon's world that took the guise of Freddy that loves being Freddy so much I guess but uh so she's uh, in Fre Freddy's world now. Um, some people like to say, some fans like to say that this isn't really Freddy, but it is, it is Freddy. It's just another version of Freddy. That's all. It's just another version of Freddy. It's, it's Freddy. <laughs> but, um, so she's now in Freddy's world and she wants to, you know, find Dylan, save him. She actually finds the script there and starts reading it. And what's actually, if you read, you know, scroll down, it, uh, scroll down the script a little bit. What's actually, uh, what the script is actually saying is actually what's going to happen next in the movie. And uh, Dylan comes up to her, and she finds Dylan, and then fucking Freddy appears and, like, slings her down to this little, like, uh, thing of water with all these eels in it and stuff. And I actually like this Freddy line where he's like, pick a pet for the rug rat, bitch. <laughs> and uh, I like this right here. It makes Heather Lankamp look like a badass where she, like, fucking grabs one of the eels and stabs it in his eye. He jerks it out, and she goes, fuck you, and knocks his damn brains out. I like that. I thought that was cool. It made the character, you know, seem like she was tired of fucking taking shit. And so she knocks his ass out. He takes off running after her, manages to knock her out. Um, he, uh, well, you get a scene where Dylan, like, fucking stabs him in the leg. And for some reason, this version of Freddy is, like, weaker than the regular version of Freddy. Because he gets stabbed in the leg in the dream world, and he's, like, limping around and can't even fucking hardly do anything. Because he's, like, I mean, he's, like, he's, like, really felt, you know, the wound. He's, like, limping and everything. So I'm thinking, how's his version darker and more evil? Well, he's supposed to be darker and more evil than the regular version of Freddy, but he's not really. He don't really. He doesn't really seem like he's any darker or more evil than. He doesn't really seem like he's more evil, really, than uh than the Freddy from the first movie, and he doesn't really seem any darker to me than the Freddy from the first movie, really either. Um, but uh, but he uh, but he seems weaker though physically. I mean, weaker. Like his powers seem weaker. But uh, at the same time, though, he's played really well by Robert England, so I don't mind it too much. And once again, I'm glad that it's a really dark, scary Freddy. And it's certainly a much better Freddy than we got in fucking Freddy's Dead. So I'll take any little minor things like that over... the. I mean, I'll take little minor things like that as long as I get a really dark Freddy like we get in this movie over the fucking Freddy from Freddy's Dead. <laughs> but, um... So we get that. It's a little bit... Kind of a little nitpick for me. And so he's chasing after Dylan and... Uh, this is where things get. This is where it gets a little bit too theatrical for me. It doesn't fit the tone of the movie. This is the climax of the film. I'm finally talking about the climax, like I've been bringing up so many times up until now. And this ending right here, this climax, I don't really care too much for. He like uh, Dylan climbs in like this fucking furnace or something like that, and Freddy like stretches his arm out and it like stretches like all the way to the end back of the furnace and like grabs him or oven is kind of like it's a metaphor for Hansel and Gretel where they burn the witch at the end so I guess it's a giant oven or something like that but it grabs a hold of Dylan his arm does and he's like pulling him towards him 
Uh, and then he's fucking like whole head, it, like his mouth opens up, and his whole like head extends, his mouth does extends, open wide enough to where he can like swallow Dylan. It just looks way too theatrical and over the top, and he's like gonna eat you up, is what he, uh, Freddie's saying, and his eyes like start bobbing up and down, his fucking face extends, and his mouth extends and gets real big so he can swallow him, and that's too over the top for a movie like this, that's too much, that style of Freddie doesn't fit this movie, I don't think, in my opinion. And then Nancy makes, I mean, <laughs> what Nancy? <laughs> Might as well be Nancy. I'll just call her Nancy, so it'll be easier to say than just saying Heather Lincoln Camp over and over. So Nancy comes up to her, coming, comes up to Freddie, manages to stab him. I think she stabs him right in the dick, too. Before she gets up to him, she's got to make it through like these quicksand, quicksand style steps, uh, reminiscent of the uh, steps from the first movie. Uh, she makes that to him. I'm pretty sure she stabs him right in the dick, which would probably take any man down, no supernatural or not. <laughs> And then you get a scene where he, like, turns around, his fucking tongue, like, shoots out and wraps all around Nancy. And, uh, Dylan comes out there and he fucking, like, grabs Freddy's tongue and, like, stabs it with a knife and, like, causes it to split in half and make Freddy's tongue look like a snake tongue. And it, uh, it's kind of like psycho stabbing, the way he's stabbing it. He's, like, jabbing it like that. It's, like, playing, like, psycho-style music. Once again, with the big, long, elongated tongue shit and everything like that, that's just too over the top for this movie. I feel like it's just too over the top. It's not bad, horrible, but it just feels too over the top and would be better suited for a movie more in the style of, like, Dream Master or Dream Child, I think. Just too over the top, I think, for a new nightmare like this, which is a film that plays it so dead serious and everything for the entire half of the movie up until the uh, uh, climax. I just feel like it's too over the top. And you get a goofy scene where Freddy's, like, looking at Dylan and he's like, Come here, my little piggy. I got some gingerbread for you. <laughs> It's funny. It is funny. I like it. It's funny. But it just doesn't fit to me, this version of Freddy. Because saying lines like that makes him seem less dark than the version of Freddy from the first movie, who had dark, you know, humor, but never said anything, you know, to the point where it was goofy sounding like that. But, um, still, though, it's still entertaining, and I still enjoy this version of Freddy, despite the little, little flaws. But, uh, they managed to lock him up in the fucking, uh, uh furnace. He's in there, or the giant oven, whatever you want to call it. He's in it. Dylan manages to make it out. They fucking grab this lever, crank that son of bitch up, and uh, you get to see the demon's like true face, and it's like this kind of slight weak morphing, kind of slight weak morphing sequence where it transforms into like some devil demon looking face with horns. But it's only like a brief what, one second, so it doesn't hurt the film really at all. And then they make it out of there, they jump into the water, the whole fucking place explodes, and they come falling out of the bed. So, you know, it's over. The day is saved thanks to Heather Lankenkamp. I'll call her Heather Lankenkamp right here because that's who, the, who she really is in the film, despite the fact that I prefer to call her Nancy. So the day is, the day is saved thanks to Heather Lankenkamp and her son Dylan. And then the, I do like this little end right here where they got, like, the script for, um, for the actual movie that Wes Craven has, like, dropped off there or something like that, I guess. And, um... And the fucking, like, uh, she starts actually reading the script as if as if it's a fairy tale to Dylan because he wants to hear it. So it's kind of like it's a fairy tale because the whole film has, like, a real fairy tale style vibe to it. And that, that to me, that's just, like, and it just ends. That's a perfect ending for the film right there. I, I like that ending. That's That works good. And the whole idea of, like, burning Freddy up in, like, a furnace or whatever, that works good, too. It fits the style of the movie. But once again, they kill him in the dream world. And kill him just by setting him on fire in the dream world. No, like, you know, fantastical way or anything. Which, a fantastical, over-the-top way wouldn't have fit for this movie. And the whole burning him up like that does fit because of the fairy tale vibe and the Hansel and Gretel shit. But still, it makes the this version of Freddy seem weaker, so I'm still kind of 50-50 uh, on it. Uh, but I still like it. It's, it still works for the movie. So, all in all, it's a three-star film out of a possible four. I also really like the score for the film. It's one of my favorite scores. I like the score for the film. Well, I wouldn't say it's one of my, I don't know if it'd be one of my favorites, but I still really like the score for the film. It is, I do think it's one of the better scores. Um, so I really like the score for the film. Um, well, yeah, I would say it's one of my favorite scores. I really like the score. Um, but yeah, it's a three-star film of a possible four. It's a really good movie, but I do think it could have been a, I do think it could have been a better movie. With a little bit more tightening with, to the film, like tighten it up a little bit more. Um... And some scenes with Robert England, you know, with Freddy, like in a face-off or something would have been, not so much a face-off, but just a scene together with both of them would have been really great and elevated the movie for me. But as it is, it's a three-star film of a possible four. And uh, I'll see you guys again with the final 
uh, Nightmare on Elm Street review for the shitty ass fucking remake. Uh, but just to conclude, you know, the original franchise here. The first movie, I love it. Four stars. Weak ending, though. Uh, second movie, uh, possession, possession idea, not as good as the uh, idea of Freddy just killing people in their dreams. Even though it's something different, it's still not as good. So it's t okay film, two stars. Once again, hurt by a bad ending. Uh, Dream Warriors, the best sequel, hands down. Uh, good, but I don't think the Dream Warriors get to do enough in the film, and I don't think they're enough of a challenge for Freddy. And Freddy gets a little too silly in maybe one or two seconds in the film, but that's about it. Uh, still four stars. Uh, part four, my personal favorite sequel is the MTV Nightmare. It's the popcorn nightmare, and I can see some people having problems with it being the popcorn, you know, over-the-top fun nightmare. But it's not so over-the-top that it's bad, and the comedy and stuff in it fits the film. Um, but, uh, Freddy does get a little bit, uh, just a little bit too goofy in this one, I think, but he's still imitating, he's still intimidating, though, but he gets, you know, more goofy, a little bit too much goofy, I think, in part four, but then part five, that's when the, uh, well, yeah, two and a half for number four, by the way, uh, part five, I think, is when the series starts going really downhill, um, by this point, they're just trying to appeal to the masses, but they're also trying to appeal to the fans who prefer the darker Freddy. And so they give, they try to do like a darker style film with part five, but they give Freddy like constant fucking one-liners, and they still try to keep the goofy dream sequences, or the more over-the-top theatrical dream sequences of part four. And it just clashes with the tone and the feel of the movie and doesn't fit at all, namely Super Freddy. Uh, so... Just a passable two stars for that one. Part six, same thing, passable two stars. They've completely sold out with part six. They, they've completely, like, uh, just went with the uh, more, the complete, you know, comedic, over the top, more mainstream version of Freddy with this movie. And they try to have some darker scenes in it, but it doesn't really fit with the film at all. Because the film has such a Looney Tunes over the top Bugs Bunny vibe. But if you're okay with them just absorbing, you know, completely the more over the top mainstream version of comedic Freddy. Uh, and just being completely fun with it. Uh, if you're oh, if you're okay with that, just them being completely well, not so much fun, but goofy with it, then you probably enjoy the film more as just like an over the top, you know, fun comedy with Freddy in it than as uh, an actual Nightmare on Elm Street film. But uh, and then Part Seven, this film, I'd give it a solid three stars. Yeah, solid three stars. I really like this film. Uh, I think it's the third best film in the series. But once again, Part Four is my personal favorite sequel. But I do think this film is the actual third best film in the series after one and Dream Warriors. But um, just to conclude everything, I love the character of Freddy. And I'll look forward with one last A Nightmare on Elm Street review with the shitty ass fucking remake. And uh, God be with me on that one. I almost feel like I'm being haunted by Freddy myself, you know, after doing, watching so many of these films in a row. You know, I, I sometimes I'm about getting to the point, you know, now where I can't even fucking hardly tell if I am dreaming or if I am awake because I feel like I'm fucking like seeing, you know, Freddy like in regular day because I've watched so many of his movies, you know, over and over despite the fact of how fun they are. Like, fuck, I don't even know if I'm even, you know, I don't even know if I'm awake right now. Shit. Because I feel so out of it after watching so many of these movies. Mm. Oh, fuck.